Welcome everyone. Um, praise God. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. And He is uh, wonderful. As the Spirit of God shares His heart, it's, it's so funny because the way the Lord is is that a lot of times He doesn't share His heart. Uh, he, and He even said, I must go away so that the Holy Spirit can really tell you about me and, and tell you my heart. And, and uh, so you have to say the Holy Spirit is good because He shares with us the heart of the Lord. And then we have to say the Lord is good because we get to know Him and see Him and be brought into Him um, and to see what it means to be in Him instead of a doctrinal statement. Amen. Well, guess what? I uh, had given you kind of a little thing at the end of the class last time where I asked you to be looking at uh, Genesis 18, and uh, we had been discussing, and I've got much more to say about it, and some of you will probably have discovered some of the things that I will be sharing, but um, we had been discussing that... Um, uh, when the th when in chapter 18 here, which is where we're at, <clears throat> the first couple of verses we saw when God appears, He appears as Elohim. He appears as three in one. And uh, we say Elohim because, number one, that's the name God used uh, in Genesis when he, when he said, let us make man in our own image and likeness. And so he was Elohim. But we discovered that a term that, um, that Abraham had been using for him in chapter 15 and chapter 17, he had been using it uh, <clears throat> in a wrong way, or better said, he didn't understand the spirit and relationship of Adonai the name that he uses um, in chapter 18 here at the very first when Abraham runs to him. And he didn't understand that, excuse me, that name and the relationship that's supposed to be there between him and Adonai, who is, <clears throat> it's, it's sort of a... Um, a name that is like an official name, Adonai is. Elohim is the designation of God from the very beginning in Genesis, all the cre all creation and all of that. <clears throat> we took the time to go through many, many scriptures uh, talking that, that referred to God as, as O Jehovah, my Elohim, in the very same phrase of name usage. And um, we found um, that, or we began to find that there was some real meaning to Adonai and to what that means and, to the, and, and what it should mean to us if we're going to relate that way. And uh, so, that said, and that refreshing your memory, uh, I don't know. Maybe nobody really looked it up. But does anybody have anything to share on what I ask you to look at um, from last week concerning this chapter in relationship to these things that were shared? And, and you can go back to 15 and 17 too because they're very apropos to uh, chapter 18. So if you have something, unmute your mic. If you want to, un mute your, your camera and uh, whichever one you want to do and just share some maybe something that you've seen on this point me yes yeah i was interested in the fact that in um genesis 18 of course when god first comes to abraham abraham calls him adonai but then and he only says it once until 
they start talking about Sodom and Gomorrah being destroyed later on in the chapter, and then right. Abraham repeatedly calls him Adonai like four different times. Every time he makes another request, he calls him Adonai. So that's what really stood out to me. Okay. Well, someone can go next. While I reach over and get something to drink, you can go ahead and talk if you, if you have something. Well, the reason why I, I mean, I did present to you that I wish that you would search it out and maybe we could talk about it, but, um, you know, um, just that we are not at all times following through on our heart for the Lord in practical manners. Now, I will say that there are those that are, and that was one of the things that blessed me about Robert and Sharon when they addressed <clears throat> the, uh, um, the wrong usage of one words. They were scripture searchers. And then I got a text from uh, Jason, and uh, Jason Main, and uh, he had been digging into the scriptures. And then Scott has uh, emailed me several things recently, not in relationship to this study, but in relationship to another one that we're doing. <clears throat> and I know, I mean, I, if you think about it, when Jesus and John 5, 39, we're all familiar with that scripture. Um, Jesus said, you search the scriptures, uh, for they are they which testify of me, but you won't come to me that you might have life. And, <clears throat> and I did a little search on that, and I did a sharing on it several different times in relationship to uh, different places in the New Testament, and particularly in the Gospels, where Jesus would speak to the people and say, if you want to know me, if you want to see me, you need to go to the Scriptures, you know. And, um, and, uh, and I've thought many times, okay, Jesus is in me, and I know that the Spirit of God gives me many of these things that I share. Uh, but the Lord would still want us not to come here, but come to the Scriptures and to lay forth God's Word and to say, Oh Lord, not just that I would know Jesus, because all of those examples are examples of Jesus walking on the road to Emmaus and everything. And instead of going, hi, it's me, you know, he began to open the scriptures so that they would know him. And, um, <clears throat> and so many other, there are many other, I mean, the one where Jesus is telling the story of Lazarus, not, not Lazarus who died and was raised again, but Lazarus the, uh, and the rich man, and how Lazarus was a poor man and everything. And uh, the rich man... They both died, and you know you you remember the story, and and uh, the the rich man was on the other side in hell, if you will, and and Lazarus was on the other side, and and he said he said send Lazarus to cool my tongue. He said no, and then he said well then send messengers to my family to tell them what this place is like so they can be warned, and Jesus said if you don't know the scriptures and you don't believe the scriptures, then you're not going to believe some messenger that comes with it. You say, well, I do believe what you share, Randy. Well, okay, fine. But I'm just saying the Word of God, Jesus said, Jesus is the one who used all of those examples right there. And he's the one who every time said, search the scriptures, you know, uh, they testify of me. And, and, and he didn't just say, search the scriptures. He says, you do search the scripture, but they testify of me and you won't come to me in the scriptures. And many times our heart, um, our heart is aimed upward like to heaven or something when we're, we're seeking the Lord, you know. Oh Lord, like this. And when our heart is moved. Um, but I think I think it would be a lot more powerful if our heart was moved to say, Lord, take this ink on white paper and make it into your full nature and your, your mind. Let your mind be in me. And, um, 
So that's just a that's just a little thing that I think it is important, <clears throat> and I think that being in a place that we're known for searching the scriptures, we we don't need to have that as a label. We need to, and what better time? I mean, you know, we need to have that as a true identity. Those of Berea were more noble than those of Thessalonica. This is God's word. They were more noble in that they searched the scriptures daily to what? It just, they didn't just have like a, well, I have a little daily, um, what is it called? A little uh, momentary thing to search out. Um, a little book that has each day of the year that I can look on. Jesus said um, uh, that the Bereans were more noble than those of Thessalonica in, the, uh, in that they searched the scriptures daily to find out those things they were being taught, whether they were of God or true. And uh, so anyway, with all that said, someone else may have something to say. So if you do, instead of raising your hand, unmute your mic. Okay, then. The next lesson, then, for today, not really. We're going to go into this. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> um, so, this begins, this story begins with Abraham sitting outside his tent. And he's, he, it's in the heat of the day. We know what that's like. And, um, <clears throat> and the Lord comes along. Elohim comes along and Abraham sees him and he gets up and he runs to him and he falls at his feet and and he and he calls Elohim Adonai and we had looked at some verses to that and it and some other we will look at that more in the coming classes but what we found is that in God and we use that that um, uh, chart of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit that if one of them we uh, you know I don't want to re-preach this whole thing because it was very in-depth but if one of them for example Jesus came down to the earth and he came down as a uh, and he came down to be crucified to show forth the nature of God uh, yes, save us of our sins. But it was more than that. Now, he had more than he didn't say, "Let us make man our own image." And and uh, but he, I mean, we would th say, "Let us save man from from hell and Satan." I mean, you know. So we're going to make him, but we're you know, buddy, we're going to do that. This spirit of the Father and the Holy Spirit at that times becomes. They all three together are Elohim. But when he comes down here to weakness and to lowliness, then the Father and the Holy Spirit become his Adonai. And just so you know, I've been searching the scriptures on this, and we've got a lot more that will really bear this out. And they become his Adonai. And this is where... where um, Abraham missed it because in chapter 15 every he used the word Adonai the name for the first time but throughout that whole time Abram is asking is saying to God you need to do this for me you haven't given to me you haven't do this this relationship isn't where you start demanding things from Adonai this relationship is that you serve him, and this is exactly what Abraham, if you will, let's, let's draw one outside of the Godhead, but ha should it should be having that same nature. You put 
way over here, you put Abraham in that. And in 15, all he's doing, God is talking or Elohim is talking. And so you'd, you'd include these three for Elohim. He's talking to them and, and, and Elohim is saying, um, I have given you the land. I will give you a seed. I will give you. I will, and it's all one sided. And instead of him coming back to his Elohim, or Adonai and, and giving and being in the, that position of, of lowliness and weakness to honor his Adonai, he, uh, you know, starts saying all that, give me, give me, give me this. And then the same thing happens um, in chapter 17, which is the one just before this one. But there uh, it is recognized, Abraham recognizes him as Elohim, the three in one, the, the, the one that is three that said, let us. Make man in our, not my, likeness, after our image. And so, um, uh, so that term is used over and over and over. And yet still, he constantly through chapter 17 is, well, towards the end there, he's talking about what you're going to give me and what you're going to do for me and all the things like that that's going to happen, that, that he wants out of it. Okay. So, we discussed all this, but uh, so at the very end, God institutes circumcision. Abraham does it. He, he gets circumcised. He circumcises Ishmael. He circumcises the servants. He circumcises everything around. He just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apply the, the, the knife to all of this. Very similar to Gilgal. Very similar to... You're not going to take any land until this is done. And that's what Gilgal, when they crossed the Jordan, everybody puts all the emphasis on the Jordan crossing the Jordan. But if they had not, once they got crossed Jordan, gone to Gilgal and done all the things that were necessary there, there would be no taking of the land. And we wonder why, why am I not taking the land? Why am I, you know, how come others seem to be doing this and that? There's reasons. It's not God's withholding from anybody. But there has to be a heart pursuit, a heart pursuit. That doesn't mean that you have to become a Bible scholar. It doesn't mean that every waking moment, but you know what? Within you, every waking moment, though every opportunity doesn't give it to come out, you need to be hungry, hurt, you know, I started to say hurting for him, not because we're messed up, but to discover that if we'd come into the right spirit and relationship, he would be our Adonai. And he would make a way where there doesn't seem to way, seem to be a way. So <clears throat> Abraham's doing that same thing um, in chapter 17. He's, you know. Uh, the worst statement of the whole thing is, you know, God is telling him, you're going to have a seed and Sarah's going to bring it forth. And this is it. And this is what we've been waiting for. And you were 70, what, 75 years when you, you came out of the Ur of Chaldees. And, and now you're 100. And this is the time. And he says, you know, he laughed and said, oh, that Ishmael. See, that is a slap in the face of Adonai. You're not giving him, you know, this is, this is our modus operandi. We constantly give him what he doesn't want. This is, this is Abraham. Oh, that Ishmael. I don't want Ishmael. I never wanted Ishmael. I've always wanted the, the seed that represents my son. Ishmael will never have the spirit of the firstborn. By the way, that's what the name of this class is. He'll never have the spirit of the firstborn. But, but the one that I choose is going to be the one that comes out of you. It's going to come out of you, and it's going to come out of Sarah. And so God is there to proclaim, proclaim that reality in, in 17. 
And Abraham, instead of saying, yes, I want to line up with that. I really care about having the right seed, the right mind, the right heart. Um, uh, I, you know, I've got these problems or whatever, but I want you to start accepting Ishmael. We can start a whole doctrine. We can make a major doctrine out of, well, God accepts Ishmael. God loves Ishmael just like anybody else. God so loved the world that he gave his only be First of all, surely all of you know that that verse is not God so, so loved. It is in this manner he loved. It is. Check it out. You, if you still question, it's because you didn't check it out. He so loved in this manner that he gave his own seed. And he didn't just give him to die for us. He gave his seed to live in us. And this is the, this is the, the um, uh, uh, communication, the communion that's supposed to be going on between Abraham and, and God in chapter 17 that I, you know, I have not just saved you from uh, the five kings in what, chapter 12, I can't remember. And I haven't just saved you from them. I haven't just saved you from Babylon. I haven't just done this for you and done that for you and, and granted you all this blessing and everything so that you could give me Ishmael. He wants his son and he wants that seed to come out of Abraham and Sarah. Not something that's foreign to his heart. Something that is not where his desire is. All right. So, um, we have... I might as well go back up here and read this first part. <laughs> this is uh, verse 1, starting in verse 1. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and... And uh, he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day, and he lifted up his eyes and looked, and, he, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, said, My Lord, and those words are my Adonai, and he never used them right until this time, that name. He never used it right. He didn't. Why? Because it's not a matter of, you know, um, uh, just calling on God using any old name you want. I mean, there, there's a relationship. There's meant to be a relationship with God. And it's more than, I'm God and you're man or whatever, mankind. Or, I'm, I'm your savior, savior and you're the sinners that I save. His heart was from the beginning Elohim's heart. This is, this is Elohim showing up because there's three of them. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. <clears throat> and when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, Am I Adonai? That's the right word now. He's, he's hit the nail on the head and he's going to prove to him that I understand now, that I understand. It's a combination of him having said, you know, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. And then he goes and does all the circumcising and blood and, and knife and everything. And he realized this is, he doesn't want the flesh. He doesn't want the flesh. He wants his son and, and many other reasons that actually brought him around. But that circumcision is huge. And um, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from, from thy servant. And we talked about the wording there in verse 3. He said, my Lord, and then he ended it with thy servant. You are my Lord. I am your servant. Now, that's, this, is not, 
this is not the same old Christian concept of, well, God is God and he's a supreme being and we need to be humble and we need to, it's not that at all. It's nothing like that. It's something way more beautiful. And, you know, and when you need to be, you need to serve him. You need to treat him like he's God and you're just a servant. It's none of that. It is none of that. It is so wonderful for him to be, as in his words, my Adonai. It is so wonderful because that gives you the right and the position to live in that spirit, the spirit of the Lamb, in this earth, in any situation, and to acknowledge Elohim, but acknowledge him in the relationship of that kind of heart that we're about to read about, that you can pour back on him, not as a lowly servant, but as a servant that understands a true relationship with Adonai. It's the same servant that Jesus was. It's the same servant that anyone would be in this situation. The Holy Spirit being down here now, having, what did I say? I don't think I said it last week or not, but, you know, that the Father has never been down here. Jesus was down here for 33 and a half years, but the Holy Spirit has been down here since Pentecost. Um, serving and giving and and some of you remember way back when Eliezer who represented the Holy Spirit left the land and came to Haran and came to get a bride for Isaac and he came with all these gifts and everything and he gave gifts to the parents and to everybody and everybody was all excited and then once he's done that and everything he's going can we, can we move on? Can I take her now? Because I'm here. I must make haste for my master and bring her to him, the Holy Spirit, bringing us, uh, riding the camels, telling his heart along the way. Let's see, Alana's on here. <laughs> you were just a little girl when I first told that story. Anyway, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> but no. The family and everybody goes, oh, can you just stay? Just stay for a while. Just stay, stay with us. We like these gifts. Give us more gifts. Everybody's after the gifts of the Spirit. We, we like these things. And, um, and we like your presence here. And, you know, it just feels so great to have you here. Um, and he's going, please don't hold me back. Please let me do what my mission is. This is the heart of the Holy Spirit today. Everybody's grabbing him and wanting to get squeeze out of him like, like they're the Adonai and he's the, uh, you know, the servant to you. And, get, you know, we want gifts and we want revival and we want this and we want that. And just like Abraham. And his heart is crying out, please let me finish my work. Let me do what I'm really down here for. But he's got that same spirit of a dove, of a lamb, of this father. It's their nature. And he, if we hold him to that, then he's stuck. If we say, yes, go, go on your way to what God called you. This is the same story in the ark of, in the ark of Noah's ark. It is the dove. And, and they're trying to figure out when are we going to get out of this stinky, bestial environment in here and he sends a raven and you know they don't have any news sends a dove the first time and he doesn't have it then he sends him again and he brings back proof that there's another reality that's living that is not like this in here and it can be had now and the Spirit of God wants to lead us to that, bring us to that, open our eyes to that. And finally, it says that Noah let the dove go. He just turned him loose to be to his freedom. And he didn't come back. And you're going, 
Well, we want. Well, he he didn't come back to just give us little tiny clues of this. He's come to make a bride, or come to make the wife of the Lamb, to bring us the, the fulfillment of the end, that we would be one even as He is one with the Father. <clears throat> anyway, so uh, and said, My Adonai, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, and here we go. Let's see if I don't have that down here. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves. Rest yourselves where? Under a tree? No, under the tree. And rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread. I'll feed you bread. And comfort ye your hearts, your hearts. And after that, and then he says, after that, ye shall pass on. For therefore are you come to your servant. This is why you came to your servant so that I could take care of you on the way of the stuff you have to deal with in Sodom and Gomorrah. This is why you came. And I'm here. You're my Adonai. I am here to bless you, to take care of you, to do whatever. That's so the opposite of the previous chapter in chapter 15 and really all through up until this time. He's starting to wake up to reality of relationship that is not one-sided. That's what God was trying to communicate in chapter 17. Hadn't talked to him in 13 years, appears to him and says, I am El Shaddai, Almighty God. Walk thou before me. And he starts talking about a walk and he starts talking about a covenant right after that. And we're going to be in covenant. We're going to be together. And it's going to be a walk together. And we're going to walk in these realities. And then... Finally, God shuts up and he says, oh, oh, that, oh, that Ishmael would live before you. And it says, God said, the, said a few things there. And then it says, and he refused to talk anymore. He, stopped. Yeah, he stopped talking. He, he ceased. No, I like that better. He ceased talking. That, that's it. If you're going to bring up Ishmael and want me to accept Ishmael, then you don't understand me at all. You don't understand my heart. You think you do because you might be emotional about it and you think that God is, this is an emotional thing. And so when you feel emotions, then you feel this or, or any number of wrong concepts that we have that don't really find him and find his heart as it is. Just like that. But guess what? Thank God, God said to Abraham, I'm not going to circumcise you. You're going to have to do it. And guess what, buddy? You're going to have to do your whole house and servants and everybody. And you need to do Ishmael too. We're going to do this. this. If we're going to do it, this is how we're going to do it. And this is how we'll come to it. So the very next thing after Abraham ends up doing that is, He's sitting outside his tent, and here comes Elohim, and now he understands the name that he was using before, Adonai. And he uses it, as Mallory said, over and over within this chapter. So he says, um, um, So he says, I'll fetch a morsel of bread, comfort ye your hearts. After that, you shall pass on. Therefore, are you come? This is why you've come. And they said, and they, 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 Elohim said, but Elohim said it as Abraham's Adonai. 
Now, we haven't fully explained it. We haven't gone through all the scriptures yet. I think we fully explained it last class. If you really want to know it and you weren't here, that's the one you need for, for, the, for the real guts of what we're talking about here. Um, and so they said, this is Elohim in the as, as representing Adonai, said, so do as thou hast said. Okay, you said it. You said all the right stuff. You said it's not about you. You said it's about, it's about me. You said that you know that I came here for this. Now, do what you said. Do what you said or quit saying. Do what you said or quit saying. I mean, it doesn't say that, but it does say uh, th this is very significant. And they said, not one of them, not two of them, they said, do so as you have said. Let's see if you'll live it. So far, you've really talked it well. We have never heard you, Abraham, talk it so well. But we're a little leery since after that last little oh that Ishmael. So let's then do it. Do as you said you would do. Okay. Verse 6, and Abraham hastened. <laughs> yeah! He hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal. Knead it and make cakes upon the hearth. What? Usually you go into the cook and you say, well, you know what, but I want this. So, you know, but he's specifically saying all this. It's almost like Abraham knows God's taste. Because Sarah doesn't, not yet. And, but it's like, do this, do this, and do it this way. Make sure it's this way, quickly, you know. Um, and then verse 7, And Abraham ran unto the herd and fetched a calf, tender and good, and gave it unto a young man. And he hasted to dress it, to dress it. And he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed, and he set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree, and they, they, they did eat. Oh, my Lord. You talk about good communion. This is, this is good communion. You say, well, where do you get that from? It's probably just a good meal. No. It's good communion. Okay, so let's look at it. Okay, first of all, he washed his feet, which is what Mary of Bethany did. He washed his feet like Mary of Bethany. He said, rest, there's rest for you under the tree. Not a tree again. Under the tree. He took bread. He cooked up bread and he gave it to him. And this is communion that Jesus said, this is my body. You guys, you 12, well, 11, one took off a few minutes ago. This is my body. Eat it. I commune in this bread knowing what it means. I, I live in this. I made bread from the very beginning, so I always think of it. I always think of the seed being crushed and made into a body. A body thou hast desired. And comfort ye your hearts. And then, of course, he runs to that young man and says, get me a fatted calf. This is, every, this is all of the stuff the Lord's been talking to us for, I don't know if it's years or not, but how many times? 64 times. Just the same communion um, tokens, if you will. The deep tokens the deep tokens of Mary Bethany's heart when Jesus is going to die in just a few days and she comes in and does it for his burial. 
and she pours out on him like Abraham is doing. Just like the father who, when his son came back, wanted to make sure he recognized that it's the son in you, not just you being my son, that's going to do anything. Get the, get the ring, get the shoes, get the robe, put it on him. Okay, that's not you. That's not because you're special. That represents the son in you. Come here. Let's get this fatted calf. We're going to kill it. Now we're going to open it up and, and you're going to look at the insides. This is us as family. Now we're going to cook this thing and we're going to eat it. Father and son together. And we're going to make merry because now you have come from come back as a sinner and as a sinner son that is not worthy to be a son. Good. You're not worthy to be the son because only he can be that. So now it is time, the father thinks, to bring you into this. Well, the father is sitting right there. In that, me in that meal, the same one that represents the prodigal son's father. The father is the real father, is right there. And the Jesus that got his feet washed is sitting right there before Abraham. This is the prelude. This is the faith of Abraham. All of this is beginning to culminate in the understanding of who he is and what relationship he wants with us. <clears throat> All right, so I, I sh should read for a second here, old oh, man. Well, I talked some at the front. That <clears throat> um, Verse 5, broken bread, that's communion. Comfort your hearts. After that, you can go. What if communion, just the symbols, but not the symbols, what if we were supposed to understand that when we eat this, we're showing forth his death. He died to be able to live in us. And that this is about that, not just saving our sorry souls from hell. And that it was more, much more of something that was in his heart. And so, so, so while all this is taking place in, let's see if I can find that, just what I had read there, um, uh, taking the, his place in this, um, the Father and the Son and the Spirit wanting to make this real to us, it is from Abraham's view it is comforting his heart because it's the real thing. It's not a bunch of symbols and, oh, praise God, and, you know, my sins and all that kind of stuff. It is something, it, the washing and all of that is comforting his heart. And then you can pass on. But I don't want you going. This is Abraham. Then you can pass on. I don't want you going until your hearts all three of them, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, your hearts have become comforted by this that I've spread before you as your servant and as you as my, uh, my Adonai Elohim with the, the, with the title. That's the better way of saying it. Elohim is the being. The three, Adonai is the title of that which pertains to me. And we'll, we haven't even really got there. But he understands this. He understands that Jesus, when Jesus went down and he was in the earth, he was that servant. And he constantly blessed the Father. And he said, the works that I do are not my own. They're the Father's. The words that I speak are not. He's not doing what Abraham was doing glorify, in, in chapter 15 through 17, glorifying himself. He's not, he's not putting himself up as if he's something special or high or glorious. He is gladly, but in doing this, he's gladly becoming the one that wants to serve him. 
Because that's the spirit of Elohim. They all cover one another. Again, the, the Father declares His Son. The, the Son declares the Holy Spirit is coming and He can't declare it rightly without the Holy Spirit. The, the Son declares the Father. It's a self-giving flow. That's my Adonai. I mean, that my um, uh, Elohim. That doesn't apply to Adonai except that Adonai is the the one who rightly deserves the honor as you willingly go into sacrificial a sacrificial realm if you will but he's also the one that's watching over you and we haven't fully looked at that part yet he is your Adonai and he is going to be the one who will deal with the evildoers at the right time. See, I would say search that out, but you know we may waste a lot of time waiting on someone to jump in there and say, I've been in the Word, I'm hungry, and I want to share with everybody, I'm so excited about Jesus. Don't get mad at me for saying it. Come on, we all ought to just, our cup should run over, you know. <laughs> Um, all right, so um, verse 8, and he took butter and milk, and he made buttermilk. No, that, that's not in here. He took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed, and he set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. Um, well, let me just read this because I keep talking. For those who know the storyline that follows after these verses, the Trinity is headed to a place where there are many enemies. So Abraham is preparing a table for them. He prepared it. He, Abraham, he prepared it, brought it, and he stood by them under the tree with them and watched them enjoy this feat, this feast of selfless giving that was done by Abraham to bless them back. They savored and ate the sacrifice. Remember, Satan, oh, Satan. Remember that Abraham had many servants. Remember that? He, he had, when I say many, he had 300 armed men and whatever, but they were all servants and they, they, they defeated five kings. He had guys that could do all this. He's running around like a young man, folks. He, I don't know if he's hit 100 right at this moment or not. I think he had in 17. But it, it's just, whatever the deal is, he's old and he is just running around everywhere because he's got the heart of it now. And, and is it fully formed in him yet? No, it's not. But it's begun. Is it fully formed in me yet? No, but it's begun. Is it fully formed in you? No, but let's, let's hope and pray that this is helping some of you to begin that hard. It's a wonderful relationship. I don't know how I'm making this sound, but it's just incredible. But how can I, how can I build the spiritual reality and form it and, and, and use human words and then and try to set that before you and, and shake you to your core of the beauty that it is. How can I do that? I can't. And I, I groan that I can't. But I can't. So may the Spirit, may the dove ride the words and bring it as, as, as something beautiful the way that dove did to Noah inside that ark. Um, I just love that Abraham stood by and watched them eat. Don't you? He stood by and he watched them eat. Oh, man. I mean, I think there's such satisfaction in that for Abraham. It's like, you know, the recognition, he just never recognized up till this point how much God was doing for him, 
how many gifts, you know, I, you know, he starts out with, I am, and uh, what is it, 15, I am thy shield and thy exceedingly great reward. And, and Abraham liked the Ishmael thing, but this, this is, that was 17, this is 15. Abraham turns and goes, you know, well, yeah, but you have not given me an heir yet. You have not given me any seed. I mean, just abominable in light of the true reality of God. Elohim and him, Elohim being our Adonai. No understanding at all. None. Okay. Well, now, now he's starting to enter into it. And it's like, this is something. Look at this. They're enjoying this. They're blessed with this. They're blessed with the, the, the rest under this tree. They're blessed with, I just said, sit down and, and see, Really, Abraham hadn't said a lot during this whole thing now. That's different. He's always talking about what God hadn't done for him. And he's, he's not, he hadn't said anything. So he just sits there and he didn't go, well, you know, how's it been today for y'all? Kind of hot, huh? Or some stupid, stupid, just nothing statement that pertains to the earth and does not envelop the, the savor and the, the, the beauty of the Lord in it, sometimes it's better just for us to keep our mouth shut and just go, hey, you know, I can't explain this, you know. And, and he didn't try, you know. God didn't put it in there if he did. But to see the Father with the Son and the Holy Spirit, each with their own body to bless them at one time and to do nothing but make it about them. You know, that's, that's been my heart because I got it from this spirit. That's been my heart for the gathering that we've had the last couple of years. Last year was meant to be not about us, not about our needs, not about what we're going through, not about prayers for us, but to, to come and to give and to pour out and to love. And if we could capture it and if we could do it together, it would be this glorious thing for Him. And we could say, you know, in our hearts, oh, He was, what was the words there in the, can't find it but where he just says that your hearts may may find rest you know what is it well I'm far from verse 5 here <laughs> okay uh, and I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort I will fetch a morsel of bread and I will comfort your hearts this spirit got me those last couple of gatherings that, that this, if nothing else, if we could do this for him, if the rest of the year were just horrendous apes, if we could do this for him, if we could come together and make sure that we don't Declare our ministry, declare ourselves, declare how good God is to me or to you or any other of that stuff. And really with all of our heart, shut up and feed him. Then we would have succeeded. Well, I think for the most part we did. I think for the most part we succeeded. It's easy for our eyes to wander on the need when it's not that time. There are times for that, but that wasn't, that won't be the time if we do that again. It's easy for our eyes to wander on somebody who's really going something, going through something and go, okay, we've got to make it about this. I mean, there were some really, some of you may not even know this, there were some really tough things going through a family going through that there and 
different people came in to minister to them, and it didn't work. They were some were I mean they were just bawling uncontrollably. And we were in service, and they were in the new room with nobody else in there hardly. And finally, somebody came to me and said, "You know, Randy, let's." Can you do something? Can you help these folks? I know what will help us. Not I, but Christ. That will help us. I know what will help us to declare the truth as it is in Him, not as it relates to us, but as it is in Him. Yes, that does relate to us, but does it always have to be about us? And the Spirit of God moved, and I didn't do it, and I just believe, and I do believe, and I don't believe it's about me, and I don't believe it's about greatness or any of that stupid stuff. I believe it's when you get out of the way, then the Spirit of God can do stuff. And my heart, I mean, I, you know, I don't, I don't know if it's even going to be possible to have a, a gathering this year. But I would love to do this stuff, you know? I mean, not physically the stuff Abraham did, but to, but to just pour it on him and pour it on him until the very end when we look at him and we say, look at, look at that. They, not just Jesus, they, Elohim. And if we knew even a step more, they, Elohim, my Adonai. Oh, the rest. Oh, the satisfaction they could have. The, just like the Lord or the Holy Spirit or whatever visiting so many churches all the time. And we always want to bring Ishmael into the equation. We always want to go, well, where's the seed? You haven't given me the seed yet. We want to see, that's making it about us. And my heart, my heart longs for this, for him. I mean, that's where, I don't even want to go into all this, but that's where the Christ's Life conferences came out of where I got sick of doing conferences with a couple of guys, not sick of them, but sick of that we would just go there and minister. And even if it was Christ, and even if it was the cross, and even if it was all this stuff, it was about them. And I wanted, it was my desire to break with all of that and to start focusing on Him more than ourselves. And, you know, I realize, I realize that saying all this can make me sound like I think I'm really something and I really, you know, I'm speaking highly of myself. But some of you know me well enough to know that's not what I'm doing. I long, I am unsettled not because there's a virus or because I can't live up to anything or whatever things. I am unsettled until he's settled. You know? Until he's come to that place in chapter 5 there. So, forgive me if it sounds like I was trying to lift up myself because it wasn't my motive. But I know that my words are so sorry compared to him and to, to the beauty that should flow from my being to him. Father, we, Father, your son, your spirit, your oneness. Oh, if we could just break, even 
even just for a while, with our ministries in this earth, with our abilities to fix things, with our vision of what m things, ministries ought to be happening right now, and we could just, just lose ourselves just for a while in wanting to have it all poured out on you. I am so hungry that your body can give you this. So, Father, I ask not that you bring it to us, but you allow the Spirit to exalt you and Jesus, and you let your Son exalt you as Father in the Spirit, and you let the Spirit, you let yourself glorify your Son. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.